Welcome back everybody to Engineering Ethics Online. Today we are going over a set of toolkits and approaches to utilize in your profession. This covers the second half of chapter 2, so let's get started. The first approach we are going to discuss is called line drawing, and it is exactly how it sounds. We are trying to draw the line of the situation we are in to make sure we are in a healthy spot. Assessing ethical problems using line drawing starts by creating the best case scenario and the worst case scenario of a given situation. They are also referred to as the positive and negative paradigms. Reflecting back on the previous lecture, we look at the paradigm of bribery. The paradigm of bribery is clearly illustrated and defined in the book. It can be divided into multiple aspects. We have here, for example, the size of the gift, uh, and if its size is greater than, let's say, $10,000, then it is probably a bribe. Now, why did I say, let's say, $10,000? Well, it depends on your business. Certain businesses, uh, it is customary and normal to have bigger size uh, gifts, big gifts. Uh, let's say you're working in the uh, banking industry or in the stock market or... Uh, in something very luxurious it is customary and normal for apple to give out gifts of ipads although they are quite experience, uh, expensive and uh, luxurious another aspect is the timing of the given gift when did you receive this gift was it before or after you made your decision and this is very important if it was prior to the decision then it is suspicious and it can be a bribe we should also check the reason behind this gift. Is it informational or educational? Or does it provide personal gain for you? We need to identify who is responsible for the decision as well in a given scenario or uh, uh, in a given uh, situation overall. Was it solely you or a group of people? If it was one person making that decision, then and that person uh, is receiving a gift, then things are suspicious as well. If there is a product uh, in the dealing, we should check its quality. Is it the best or worst in the market? If it is not that good, then there is room for suspicion as well. What is the price of this product then? Is it pricey or is it the cheapest in the market? If it is bad and expensive, then why are you considering it in the first place? So let's put this knowledge to use. In the, uh, in the following example, we have an engineer named Victor who works at a large construction firm. He was solely assigned by his company to select rivets for their projects. He decided to choose Akim Rivets for the job. They offer a high quality to cost ratio, but they are still on the expensive side. After the decision was made, Victor received an all expense paid trip to Jamaica in order to attend the Akim Technical Forum. Although it sounds technical and educational, there will be a lot of fun activities included in this trip. So is this a gift or a bribe? Try to solve it for yourself first before we jump into the solution using line drawing. So first, let us construct our line drawing table. By stating the feature, then placing the positive and negative paradigms on two opposite ends, and then uh, placing a line between them. The first feature is a gift size. From the description, it is clear that the gift size is quite pricey uh, and big. Therefore, it is safe to assume that it is placed 
near the large side as marked by the X. We move on to check the timing of the gift. The gift was presented after the decision was made, so it is clear it is closer it is clear that it is closer to the non bribe side of things. Now, what is the reason behind this gift? Well, it is equally educational and personal fun. So it is fair to place the X somewhere in between or in the middle. Additionally, Victor was solely responsible for the decision. Therefore, it is a safe bet to place the X near the bribe paradigm. We also need to check how good is the product. Based on the text, it is of good quality. So it is logical to place it near the best side of things, the non-bribe paradigm. Finally, the cost of the rivets was stated to be pricey. Therefore, it is safe to assume that it is a bit closer to the bribery side of things. Now that we have constructed our table properly, we analyze how the line forms. The center line of the points is close to the gift paradigm than the bribe paradigm. And therefore, it is safe to assume that it is not a bribe. It is important to highlight that not all issues have black and white right or wrong answers. Many issues can be novel gray areas that we have to deal with. They require fur further exploration and critical thinking as well. We are not binary code by the end of the day, we are humans. As humans, we can come up with creative solutions that ensure the safety of society and minimizes any sort of damage. Another approach that can be used to assess situations is virtues. It is one of the most known and oldest forms of morality. Virtues are character traits that a person can align themselves with in order to conduct and achieve morally desirable actions. Such virtues include courage, honesty, loyalty, and benevolence. Virtues are definitely good to, uh, to possess as they help a person build a good character. Yet they are quite difficult to enforce, assess, or measure. We do not have measures or meters for loyalty and honesty, like we have thermometers, for example. Therefore, models of morality kept on developing beyond that, that point because humanity wasn't satisfied, this wasn't enough. We need clearer boundaries. From there, another approach was developed. It is called the rules and duties approach. In moral decision making, people become bound by rules and duties. So following this approach requires you to align yourself by do's and don'ts. And holding to them in a strict fashion. The idea here is simple. Follow the rules and you are moral. Stray from them and you are immoral. Unlike the virtues approach, the rules and duties approach is easy to measure due to having clearly defined aspects and boundaries. Yet on the other hand, Having a series of rules may have those rules contradict each other in certain situations. One example would be abortion. When a woman is pregnant but the delivery is deemed to be fatal to the child and the mother. If you abort the child, then you violate the do not kill rule. And if you do not, then you'd be killing the mother, which is a closed loop and you will be stuck in, this, uh, stuck in this contradiction. To further look 
at techniques for developing common morality, we are going to look at two schools of thought, which are utilitarian thinking and respect for persons. We will look at their general definition, limitations, and some iterations of them. First comes utilitarian thinking, which we have discussed before as well. It revolves around one main idea, maximizing the cumulative human well-being. Therefore, a person is considered to be moral if they follow the actions that fulfill that goal. On the other hand, the respect for persons approach tries to preserve and nurture the moral agency of individuals. Accordingly, it supports and encourages rules and ideas that serve the individual moral agency. It is also important to protect individuals from any unwarranted interference from others. In other words, we're setting up for individualism and encouraging it. Although both approaches are popular schools of thought, they come with interesting limitations. On one end, utilitarian thinking does not take into consideration the intent behind the action. Results are the only moral measure. This can allow a series of evil actions in the name of something good. Additionally, utilitarian thinking has no proper definition for justice. And by consequence, justice receives little to no consideration. Finally, in pure utilitarian thinking, if the death of one person can save five people, for example, then that person must sacrifice his or herself for the benefit of these five people. This is too much to ask and too big of a sacrifice in a logical way of thinking. On the other end, the respect for persons approach struggles with contradictions. One example that was used earlier is abortion. RFP does not allow abortion in cases where the mother and child would die. That is mainly due to the principle of double effect. The principle of double effect allows actions that carry two outcomes, a good and a bad. Yet, this action has to meet four conditions. The first condition, the act in its essence is allowable. Second condition, the bad consequence of the act cannot be avoided. Third condition, the bad effect is not the means for the effect. And finally, the fourth condition, the good effect outweighs the bad effect. We can see that number three will not allow the abortion of a soul individual, in this case, uh, a baby in the womb, for another individual to live which is in this case, the mother. To mitigate and improve the two models, a series of approaches were developed. We will be discussing six of them. The first one is the cost-benefit approach. This approach follows three simple steps. The first step is to identify all possible options that can be done. Then, each option's benefit-to-cost ratio is determined. Calculating the benefit-to-cost ratio must be very thorough and encompasses all possible details. Finally, select the option with the highest benefit-to-cost ratio. Plain and simple, quite similar to the Pinto case. We move on now to the act utilitarian approach. This approach represents utilitari uh, utilitarianism in its purest form. The first step in applying this approach is to identify all possible options as well. Everything is on the table. So leave nothing out. Second, determine the people that will be affected by those options. Finally, select the option with the maximum human benefit and inform your audience. If you thought an act utilitarian approach would be extreme and may allow for a multitude of atrocities, you might be onto something. 
For that reason, the rule utilitarian approach was developed. Similar to the act utilitarian approach, the rule utilitarian approach starts by identifying all possibilities. Nothing is off the table. But afterwards, a list of rules that cannot be crossed is formulated. This, rule, uh, this list of rules acts as a filter for the options. After filtering the options, we use the remaining uh, options to identify our audience and address them. Now, we get to select the option that maximizes the benefit while double checking again with our list of rules. The more we look into those approaches, one would ask, wouldn't it be easier if we had one simple idea that holds a total solution for the moral issues of the world? Well, the golden rule approach has that idea. And the universal concept it adopts is reversibility, which urges the use of questions like, what if everyone did it? And what makes you an exception? And what if someone did that to you? If the answer to such questions is negative, then probably the action is immoral, and therefore you should not commit it. An improvement to the golden rule approach is the self-defeating approach. Here an action is considered immoral if it was considered self defeating. An action is considered self-defeating in two cases. It cannot be performed if universalized. For example, imagine a world where everyone lies when getting a loan and never give it back. Then trust will be out of the question and no one will, will trust anyone, especially when they want a loan. Eventually, no one will loan anyone anymore. Thus makes the initial action itself impossible. So you cannot take any, uh, any loans anymore. You cannot lie for loans. It rendered itself impossible, so it defeated itself. That's how it became self-defeating. The other way an action can be self-defeating if the result of the action is eliminated. Let's say someone cheated on an exam to get better grades than their classmates, for example. If everyone cheated, all students will get good grades, so there is no difference between them. Thus, the assessment becomes pointless. So, either the exam will be cancelled, or it will be rendered useless, or it will be repeated. So the action itself will become self-defeating because it is rendered useless. There is no point, if everyone did the same thing, then there was no point of doing it in the first place because nothing is gained anymore. Finally, we have the rights approach, which tries to identify which rights are at stake in any possible action. After ranking the tiers, of rights and identifying the affected individuals, the decision maker should select the option that minimizes the cumulative violation of rights. And here we see the contrast with the utilitarian approaches. Utilitarian approaches try to maximize the cumulative benefit. The right approach tries to minimize the violations to human rights. With the rights approach, we reached the end of the Ethical Toolkit video and Chapter 2 of the book. Tune in to Chapter 3 for more interesting topics and cases.